Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Boker Tov. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll begin with a with a with a blessing with a bracha. Baruch Atah Ronai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kishanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu La'Asok B'Divrei Torah. Amen. Amen. Grateful for the opportunity, the life sanctifying act of studying and busying ourselves with Torah. So we're going to conclude the book of Genesis of Bereshit. Uh, we're almost we're almost caught up to ourselves in the uh, in the reading cycle. Uh, but uh, then we'll see we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, I also just want to put in a little hint the beginning before we conclude today. I have a little bit of a conflict with the date in January. Normally it would be um, the 10th of January. Uh, I'm involved in a in a presentation that will probably last until about 1115 that morning because they're doing it on east coast time um are, are would people be okay it's starting later that day or should we we'll send out a thing and suggest a different an alternative date i love the idea of starting later starting later starting later always works good for me <laughs> okay great Thanks. starting later works for me was that a, would that be a major conflict for anybody no no Okay. Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll plan on starting like I'll double check the exact time of the other, and then we'll send something out. We'll we'll start either like eleven fifteen or eleven thirty on January tenth. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, uh, David. You wanted to uh, summarize for us the first portion, which is Vayishlach. Vayishlach. Yes. I was, first, I will do our poetic quote, which the tradition uh -huh. Okay. And today is from uh, Sevilla Martin's famous poem, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Mm -hmm. And it's a very beautiful poem. I heard someone recite it on a TV program once. But it, but it, is, um, it is very religious in nature and not our religion. So what I did was that I rewrote it, and it goes like this. And I rewrote it in 2014. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw closer to the sky. From care, it sets me free. My eye is on the sky, and I know it watches me. My eye is on the sky, and I know it watches me. Thank you. Lovely. Um, Thank you. I'm hoping that if it stays clear tonight, We'll be able to see the biggest meteor shower of the year. It is the Geminis, which peaked tonight, but it's not supposed to be clear. So there we go. Okay, so we're at chapter 32 chapter of Genesis. Yeah. 32 4. 32 4. Genesis. Uh -huh. <clears throat> It's all yours, David. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, under the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you say unto my lord Esau, Thus saith thy servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. And then it turns out that he meets Esau. He meets Esau with, uh, who brings 400 men, and he's very frightened. And he actually gets into what I believe is a res what he thinks is a wrestling match with Esau. But it turns out that he's not wrestling with Esau at all, but he's wrestling with an angel. And, uh, and uh, so let's see what we're doing. And... Uh, Earlier in Genesis 26, God reminded Isaac, uh, God reminded Isaac, this was this one of the interesting things about this portion is that it does head back and it takes us back a little bit uh, into earlier portions of Genesis. For example, 
in Genesis 26, verse 4, God reminds Isaac that he had promised Abraham that he would make his heirs as numerous as the stars. And then later in Exodus 32, Moses reminded God that he had promised to make them as numerous as the stars. And, um, and, and in the first reason, they go back and they do this. Um, they go back and they actually do this, this reminder that uh, our, that the seed of Abraham will be as numerous as the stars. And uh, okay, we're now in the third, let me see where I am. In the third reading, Jacob named the place where he and the angel um, wrestled Peniel. And he says that he had seen God face to face and lived through the angel. And at sunrise, Jacob was limping from an injury to his thigh. Because of this, the Israelites do not eat the sinew of the vein that is the hollow of the thigh, because the angel touched the hollow of that thigh. And when Jacob saw Esau coming with 400 men, he divided the family, putting the housemaids and their children foremost, and then Leah and their children next, and Rachel and Joseph at the back. And uh, Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, and kissed him, and they wept. And uh, the third reading ends at that point. And then the fourth reading, on the fourth reading, uh, the men of the city are in pain, and Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, no relation, each took his sword upon the city with stealth and killed all the men, including Amor and Shechem, who took Dine out of the city. And Jacob's sons, did an evil thing at this point. They looted the city, taking as their booty their animals, their wealth, and uh, everything else. And then this, also in this part of the reading, Rachel has an unhappy and premature death. She dies in childbirth after she has her son Benoni. And Jacob called him Benjamin. And they bury Rachel in Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar on her grave. And the first time I was in, first time I was in Israel, back in 1976, so we were traveling through Bethlehem, there is a marker that is allegedly seen to be Rachel's tomb. And while Israel dwelt in the land, Reuben lay with Jacob's concubine, Bilah, and Israel heard of it. The text then recounts Jacob's children born to him at Padam Aram. Jacob came to Isaac at Hebron. Isaac died at the age of 180. Boy, those were the days. And Esau and Jacob buried him. The second open portion ends there. And um, and then um, and then we go on. And then we go on into other readings. Um, and we go into the, um, the book of Obadiah. And uh, that, that is the uh, Haftorah of this portion. It deals with God's wrath against the kingdom of Edom, who are descended from Esau. And if you could just hold on a second. And... Uh, Yeah. And uh, in the book, in the Haftorah to this portion, uh, the uh, Sephardics read from Obadiah, which happens to be one of my favorite things, my favorite uh, paragraphs in Jewish liturgy, liturgy, one of my favorite extractions from it. And in Obadiah chapter 3, verse 4, it says, though thou make my nest as high as the eagle, and though thou set it among the stars, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. 
So I think this is an interesting portion and uh, it reminds us of Rachel's death. And uh, even though we really see her as uh, one of the matriarchs, she did have a very early and premature death. Anyway, I guess that's, that brings us to the end of my portion. And I'll now hand it back to you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, David. And, and yes, those of us who have been to Israel know exactly where that spot is, allegedly. Kever Rachel, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, grave of, of Rachel. If, if in modern, modern Jerusalem, if you go to the, where the old train station is, <coughs> and then, then go on that main road due south towards Bethlehem, you can't miss it. Uh, you, you pass what's called Kever Rachel. Before you get there, there's a, there's a very famous kibbutz called Ramat Rachel. The, the 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 high point that overlooks the the grave of uh, of Rachel and until sixty seven that was the that was the border also. Anyway, okay. Oh, so could, could I question? Uh, oh, just, please, just please, a quick please. question, because I, I don't recall this. Uh, what the level is of historical accuracy for that site, um, or uh, well. You know, or, or or like what what the history is because a lot of these sites are misnamed. You know, uh, sure. uh, Absalom's grave is not Absalom's grave right. either. You know, so right. you know, just well, wondering. I'm, how I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are theories both pro and con. But but the the important thing, and we'll refer to it again a little bit later, is that traditionally, historically, and even I guess I could say romantically. Um, the, 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 the point is that Rachel was not buried with the other matriarchs. Mm. She was buried separately, um, uh, because of the premature birth with, with, uh, with Benjamin, uh, Ben Oni as, uh, the, the, the son of my, of my pain, my distress, as, uh, as David was saying. But uh, whether actually that is the tomb, I, I don't know, whether the tomb of, of King David or Absalom or whatever, right. And ask, ask, your, ask your local resident tour guide and they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll quote whoever taught them and on and on back through the generations. Uh, anyway, so we, I, I okay, so we can, we can, oh, oh sure, Lynn, go ahead. Before we go ahead. Sure. Um, I thought David said that the Haftarah was Obadja. Obadiah. 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 Says, uh, um, Hosea. Uh, yes, the uh, Ashkenazis, I think. Right, yeah. Sophia. Sometimes there's a difference between the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi. That's what I was asking. So the, the, the Sephardi the, right. is Obadiah. Obadiah, yes. Right, yeah. And uh, yeah. Obadiah is a very famous book. They're all famous. But <laughs> when I was growing up, at the uh, Montreal the Astronomy Club in Montreal, they had a little glass pig. And the tradition is, as you walk into the building, you put a quarter or so into the pig. And um, they use you say it was a pig? It was a pig. A glass pig. A glass in, pig. in the synagogue? Not in the synagogue. This was at an observatory. Oh, at the observatory. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I missed it for a second. The in charge also really loved Obadiah. And uh, they called it Obadiah, the observatory pig. Uh -huh. And one of my telescopes is named Obadiah. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I just I just use the Sephardic one because I happen to like Obadiah. But the Ashkenazic ones were a little bit different. And Steve, you're absolutely right. I have investigated the historicity of this. And uh, there actually is no real historical evidence that Rachel's tomb is exactly where they say it is. But so what? Sometimes you got to say what the heck, and just go ahead with it. Yeah, you know I, when you they know, built it, there I, may, no, have, been, there may I, have been I, a gas I, station there already, and yeah. so they had to move it across the street. Uh, you know, we don't yeah. really know. Right. No, no, I'm I'm not. The, the goal of my question was not kind of to be picky -yoon, but I'm just curious as to, okay, how did it emerge that that might be the grave? You know, if there, because sometimes there are stories going back that explain well. Mm -hmm. This is why traditionally this is assumed to be the grave. This is where it started. You know, it started with the, I I don't know, the Christian fathers or what? Right. <laughs> you know, who the, decided. The locals, the locals could have had, a, 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 you know, a particular 
uh, idiomatic yeah. phrase name for that place that somebody right. said. Yeah, yeah. Of, often there's an from, Arab right. tradition that yeah. it just has a traditional name that sounds suspiciously historical, you know. So exactly. Actually, the uh, historicity of the entire Exodus is in doubt. The whole thing, because archaeologists doing research in the area where the Israelites were alleged to have wandered have come up with almost nothing of pottery or shards or anything that might indicate that that happened. And it might have been, there may have been a historical basis of a smaller group that crossed the desert at about that time. But the entire people of Israel, it has not been confirmed by any archaeology. And so we just really have to take that on faith. Right. You know, just, so, just concerning, if I could, insert a really sure. quick comment, uh, you know, concerning the historicity of the Bible. And I think people have mentioned this before, this book, that's really excellent. It's uh, <laughs> Asimov's uh -huh. Guide to the Bible. And it surprised me because he was, well, he's, he was a prolific science and science fiction writer, uh, you know, got a PhD in chemistry, but he knew an awful lot about the Bible, <laughs> apparently, you know, this isn't something you just, you know, I, I read, you, you really get into it, you're, you're amazed. I think this might be a very underrated uh, uh, resource, you know, as a mom's gift. And, uh, and if I guide may, guide to the Bible. Yeah, yeah if I, I may, I, Lynn, Lynn Liebman, aren't, aren't we kind of crossing over into some of your area as well? Yeah. yeah so don't, Definitely. don't hesitate to jump in if you have some of the scholarship that you oh. can add to this. Oh, yeah. but but uh, I, I I mean I was reading one of his old science fiction stories from 1952, where one of the characters is somebody's wife named Jezebel, and the husband at one point goes into a long, very, uh, just very impressive, very detailed history of all the intrigues of the kings and you know who Jezebel exactly was and you know, and wow. You know, he he must have had a very like going way back. He must have had a real good education mm -hmm. in uh, Chumash <laughs> and yep. beyond. You know, in the yep. Bible. Okay, Lynn, I'm, I, I want to jump I, in. Yeah, I agree with um, David that there's no exit uh, evidence for a massive um, archaeological evidence, massive group of people wandering in the Sinai and, and, and entering, but there may have been a small group, maybe small repeated groups coming in. Um, and there's definitely, I'm sure you know, invasion evidence, um, you know, burn layers at uh, Hazor and various other places. So mm -hmm. um, something was going on. Right, <laughs> right. And it, the, the, uh, the the, the text that we have that we call Torah or Holy Scriptures could very easily be an, an, an anthology, an amalgam of different stories collected from different places and now then brought into focus as if they all occurred for one people. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, Richard, I think it was Richard Friedman who wrote the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it talks about the the um, the different document, the documentary hypothesis and the, the whole how it was edited probably wasn't edited to what sixth century right mm -hmm. bce maybe by ezra um so there's a, like a redactor who's pulling it all together and making decisions as to why do we have three stories about the sister wife motif and not editing them out and other things that are what is included and what is left out um, so it is definitely a compilation. It's it's with many hands. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Th thanks for the all the uh, the information and the insight. So we'll continue. So after Vayishlach is when we actually begin. Uh, as I mentioned on on Shabbat, what what the uh, uh, the rabbis or the writers call the the Joseph cycle or the Joseph narrative the the concluding uh, chapters and portions of the book of Bereshit of Genesis all focus on the character of 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 Joseph um 
so Jacob and, and beginning now with Vayisha, but that's like chapter 37 of Genesis, Jacob and, and the clan are now uh, settled back in, in, uh, in Canaan and Canaan. Uh, and we're introduced to Joseph, who's the favored and favorite son of of Jacob, uh, along with all uh, along with all the other bro uh, the other brothers, the one sister who's not necessarily mentioned here. But uh, Joseph, uh, as a young lad, is a is a is a dreamer, and he tells his brothers and he tells his mother and his father that he dreams of ruling ruling over them. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other brothers are, uh, are, are, are jealous, um, and they're offended and they're resentful, um, uh, and, uh, they, 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 they plot that one day when Jacob sends Joseph out, uh, and we need to try to understand what exactly is his, his role, but Jacob sends Joseph out to, uh, to, to check on the, on the brothers, um, uh, whether it's as a spy, whether it's with the hope that uh, that the other brother, brothers will accept him and allow him to uh, to be a shepherd along with them uh, uh, for whatever, um, but they plot originally to to kill him. Here comes that teller of tales and that dreamer of dreams. Um, we're going to kill him, but but Judah persuades them um, to sell him to the uh to a band of ishmaelites who are uh passing by in the caravan uh um and then they uh they they wipe some of uh some blood animal blood on uh, joseph's multicolored coat and bring it back to jacob and say that his son had been uh killed by a by a wild beast so um we'll just pause for an extra moment i want to share that uh, the rabbis, obviously, like us, throughout the generations, have been questioning: Well, what what is it really about this character of Joseph, uh, who's who's going to wind up being the first one in our tradition in the Hebrew people? Now, Noah also was given this adjective, but in the Hebrew people, Joseph is the first one to be called a tzaddik, to be called a saint. Um, but it doesn't really sound like his behavior is so righteous and so so saintly. Uh, so some of the rabbis come to his defense and and saying, no, uh, he was really, he was naive, he was innocent, uh, he, he didn't have, I guess what we would say today, he didn't have the filters on what he was saying, what he was talking about to be able to uh, realize what the impact, the consequence would be of the things that he was saying to his brothers and to, to his parents. Uh, why was he the favorite? Well, most importantly, because he was the son at the time. He was the only child through Rachel, who was uh, Jacob's favored wife and had intention originally was supposed to be the first wife. Um, and so as a result, Jacob spent more time with him. Jacob uh, taught Joseph more of the stories of his tradition and about Isaac and about Abraham, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the rabbis, uh, come to uh, Joseph's defense, but most of them say no. You know, he was a he was a he was a tattletale. Um, he he enjoyed and played upon that favorite status, and he held it over uh, his brothers. Um, very self centered and uh, an immature and spoiled in in that sense. There are a number of issues that come along in that journey that Joseph takes to seek out his brothers and he meets he meets a man who is that an angel is that trying to understand himself the same thing like Jacob had, had with the the wrestling that David was talking about in the previous week's uh, parsha uh so Joseph is sold into Egypt and then the text kind of puts a pushes the hold button for a minute uh, and we go back to a, a quick story, a sad story of uh, of Tamar, who is uh, the widowed daughter-in-law of Judah. And uh, Judah promises that one of his other sons will marry Tamar after she's been widowed. But then he withholds that that promise. And so Tamar tricks Judah into sleeping with him. Uh, and then when she uh, becomes pregnant and is ready to give birth, 
the 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 all the other townspeople or the members of the uh, the informal court uh, accused her accused her of playing harlot, uh, but she proves to them that no, it was actually Judah himself who slept with her, and he admits publicly that she is more in the right than I. Uh, so kind of admitting his own human human foibles and fallacies and the child is uh, is born and, and is welcomed into the into Judah's uh, tribe as well. Then we revert back to Joseph in Egypt. He has been sold uh, to uh, somebody in the royal court by the name of Potiphar um, uh, and he quickly and Joseph quickly rises to become a uh, the major domo of uh, Potiphar's household. Um, uh, his Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph, the young boy, uh, so to speak, and she tries to seduce him. He refuses, which is the first time that 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 the implication is that because he's he's righteous, he's a tzaddik, so he's not going to be he's not going to be seduced, and certainly not by uh, by an Egyptian wife, uh, his boss's wife, if you will. He refuses, but she accuses him. Uh, of trying to seduce her, and uh, Potiphar has him thrown in jail. Joseph is now imprisoned. He meets two other. We don't really have a sense of how long this 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 goes on, but he meets uh, two other uh, two his two other cellmates uh, from uh, from the royal court, the 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 um, cupbearer um, and the uh, and the chief baker. Uh, each of them have dreams. Joseph interprets those dreams, saying that the cupbearer will be get laid free, and uh, the baker, however, will be will be hung. Um, that does come to pass. The cupbearer is returned to royal service. Joseph had had uh, pleaded with him to not forget me, uh, don't forget me back here in prison. But the cupbearer did that. The baker was was executed. Um, so that's we kind of left. It's just like in the um, uh, just like in the in the soap operas that my wife watches all the time. Uh, you know, we're kind of left left hanging, and and but and the cupbearer forgot about Joseph, uh, and you know, and, and and tune in next week or tune in tomorrow to see what uh, what exactly uh, what exactly will uh, will happen. Um, the um, Next portion is called Miketz. Uh, Miketz is is always read, incidentally, so you just think back a couple of weeks, Miketz is always read on the Shabbat during Hanukkah. So uh, sometimes there's a homiletic con, uh, uh, confluence between the, the dreams of the Pharaoh and, uh, and, and the leaders of the Maccabees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh has two dreams. No one can interpret them out of his royal advisors. Um, and uh, the cupbearer finally does remember Joseph, who had, in, had, had interpreted the dreams back in the jail, uh, and brings Joseph uh, to, the, uh, to, to the Pharaoh. Uh, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same, that there will be seven years of plenty and then seven years of uh, of, of famine uh, and they Egypt should prepare so they will be able to rise to uh, being the center of the of the known world at the time if they have all the provisions available and everyone else will have to come to Egypt to buy grain. Uh, Pharaoh says, "Hey, that's a good idea. I'll put you in uh, in in charge." Uh, and Joseph rises up then to uh, become very important in the in the Pharaoh's royal court. Uh, with famine all around, literally, uh, this is eight, nine years later, um, Jacob sends his sons, all except for Benjamin, to Egypt to find food. Uh, Jacob, when they come before Jacob, who's in charge of all the, the uh, distribution of the grain, Jacob recognizes them. Uh, they don't recognize him, certainly. Um, and uh, he accuses them of being spies rather than 
of just coming to buy to buy food. Now, again, there may there may have been this is another example of where there there, there may have been some truth in the stories that uh, the different tribes in or peoples surrounding the Egyptians uh, not only may have been coming to try to buy provision, but also may have been spying and preparing for other attacks. Um, so that seems to fall into this into this category. Um, and Joseph says, I'm going to hold on to uh, Simeon or Shimon, Simon. Uh, I will hold on to him as ransom. Um, the rest of you have to go back. You told me that you have an elderly father. You told me that you have a, a, a much younger brother. Uh, I, I will only accept your uh, the, the truth of your story if you bring that young man. This is Joseph, ultimately it's Joseph's true younger brother, Benjamin, but uh, the boys don't know that. Um, but Joseph said, I, then I will accept your, uh, your story that you're not spies uh, if you bring Benjamin, uh, Benjamin to me. And so he held uh, Simeon, who may have been the chief spokesman, held him as, uh, as ransom. Um, they paid for, they purchased food, uh, but Joseph arranged that before they left, he secretly put the money that they had spent for the food back into their back into their sacks and uh, wonder of wonders uh, what what caused all that. Jacob sends them back, Judah pledging uh, to Jacob that he will take personal uh, responsibility for for Benjamin. Um, and so they once once again come back to appear before Joseph. Uh, Simeon is freed. Uh, but Joseph still doesn't reveal himself uh, in, in verifying their authenticity. Uh, uh, he, he hosts them with a, with a big farewell banquet, um, and he has his own personal wine cup placed in Benjamin's bag. Now he wants to test them not only for their authenticity, but now he wants to test them to see uh, how they respond to the younger or youngest, whom he assumes probably is now also Jacob's favorite son, Benjamin. So he, he places or has his wine cup placed in Benjamin's sack. Um, they, the, the, the boys all uh, get ready to return back to Jacob and poof, they're, they're stopped, they're arrested and uh, the wine cup is found. They're now accused of being thieves, and Benjamin is to be held in ransom until Jacob, uh, until Jacob finally comes before Joseph. And once again, it's tune in next week if you want to see how how this uh, this resolves itself. In the portion Vayikash, which we just read last uh, Saturday morning, begins at chapter forty four. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Genesis, um, they, uh, Vayigash means he, he approached, uh, and the word, the verb happens to occur quite a few times in the, in the first several paragraphs, uh, each of them approaching and coming closer and understanding, uh, and accepting each other. Um, uh, uh, Judah says to Joseph, if you refuse to let Benjamin, Benjamin go, our father will die. So take me instead. Then then uh, recognizing that that they indeed feel uh, a loyalty and an understanding and an empathy with their father, their elderly father, Jacob, who they don't want him to lose another son at that point. Although, again, sidebar, we don't know if Joseph, if Jacob was ever told the truth of what had happened, uh, we really don't. We we really don't know even through the conclusion of the story. Judo says, "Take me instead, uh, and let Benjamin return to our father, lest lest he die." And at that point, then Joseph reveals himself. Uh, the brothers ve'yiv halu echav. The brothers are astonished. Uh, and they and and they don't say anything. They're dumbstruck, as as it were. Um, Joseph says, uh, "I am your brother Joseph, 
uh, whom you sold into Egypt. It, uh, but but don't blame yourselves. It was all got part of God's plan, and it was for michye. It was for the sake of life, future life, and a pleita, and a, and a surviving remnant, which is a phrase that we hear again after the Holocaust. But uh, that, that it was all part of God's plan, which we cannot understand. But so don't feel that guilty. Interesting that Joseph would be saying this, whether the brothers actually believe it or not. Um, so I want you. I want you now to go get go get my dad. I can't believe Haoda Vichai. Dad's really still alive. I I, I just can't believe that. But let's bring him here. Let him see that I am alive and everyone will live happily ever after. I'll be able to take care of you. I'll be able to provide uh, food and sustenance for the whole clan. Uh, you will all, you especially, Jacob, uh, will be close to me uh, because there are still five more years of famine to come. And I want to make sure that everybody is okay. There's an emotional reunion uh, then of uh, Jacob and and Joseph, jo uh, and Joseph Joseph brings Jacob back and introduces him to the Pharaoh. Jo the text actually says that Jacob, uh, the the Pharaoh greets Jacob and Jacob blesses the Pharaoh. I had some comments about that on on Saturday morning, and so Jacob and the clan now live in Goshen and uh the section of section of egypt um which is closer lynn again closer goshen is closer to the nile it's or on, on the there's like where they're in the delta right. and there's several branches of the nile they're on right. the northeast section the nor northeast of, section from of the from delta, the capital of the, area. the triangle right. it's yeah. very close the, the capital is more south slightly west so you would go right. up on an angle the capital okay. is um by Tanis, i believe uh-huh uh, okay. yeah all right so that's where they're they are now in in goshen but that's still still considered egypt rather than canaan rather than than yes. promised land okay then we get to this week's portion which is the last parsha of uh, the book of of uh, the book of Genesis, uh, which means he lived, uh, and it actually includes the death of both Jacob and and Joseph. Uh, just a second, Steve. Just like back at the beginning of Genesis, the the chapter that talks about the death of Sarah actually is called Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah. And here, uh, even though this this includes the death of Jacob deaths of Jacob and Joseph, the portion is still known as Vayachi. Yes, Dr. Marin, you're you're muted. Steve, you're muted. Okay. There you are. Now I just just something I came across in the Chabad website uh in the commentary uh when Joseph is sending off his brothers to go and fetch Jacob the final thing he says is and it's translated as don't become agitated on your on your journey on your journey right which is right. a little peculiar what is he talking about don't become agitated you know when you go i'm sending you back they should be happy why would they become agitated so in the word that's used in hebrew is tir de gizu, which in modern hebrew kind of means don't get pissed off don't get right. angry <laughs> right and then it's even more peculiar. So, and the rabbis have sort of a very, there are a bunch of different jirashes, I guess you could see on this. Um, you know, one is that um, it means really don't, and somehow I'm not even sure how they make the connection, but supposedly he's talking to them about studying Torah. And he says, uh, don't sure. get too, don't get too immersed in Torah on your travel because you'll get distracted and you'll get lost. You know, mm -hmm. study right. a little Torah, but not too much. Right. And then, well, that's, uh, but that's, the, if you, if you go back to like the first thing that we said that Jacob sends Joseph out to find his brothers, the, mm -hmm. the, Chabad, the Chabad and that, that tone of commentary probably also said, 
okay, it you know it's it's Monday morning or it's Thursday morning. You know, Joseph, go go find your boys and teach them some Torah, because yeah. Jacob, <laughs> Jacob, you will remember, according to that stream of thought, already in um, in Rachel's belly in Rachel's womb. Jacob was that's why that Jacob and Esau were fighting because Jacob wanted to emerge already to be able he was so anxious to study Torah so th that was the the basis of his life according to some of the rabbis so yeah it makes sense you know you know I'll tear you know don't don't argue with don't don't be distracted don't, you know don't, 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 don't and all that right that's great that's great um okay so Vayachi, as I said, uh, is going to bring everything to a climax, and um, it's a long, it's a long portion. Uh, it describes the last years of Jacob's life. We might think that once he has arrived in in Egypt, and once he has been greeted, welcomed by the Pharaoh, once he has seen that Joseph is still alive, once he has blessed Joseph. And um, and his, uh, uh, you know, and 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 the Pharaoh, and we, we might think, okay, we can close the book on Jacob and now move on. But no, Joseph, Jacob actually lives seventeen more years in in Egypt um, as the as the patriarch, as the head of the head of the clan. Um, as he is on his deathbed, he says to uh, to Joseph and the and the other. Uh, the other sons promise me that I'll be buried in the cave of Machpelah. Uh, now, uh, that's on the one hand, that's promise me that I'll be able to uh, be buried with my ancestors. That's in case they were wondering, do you want to be buried? Dad, when you die, do you want to be buried with Rachel? Or do you want to be buried with Leah and Abraham, you know, grandfather and your father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so he gives them that answer. He wants to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. Um, but before he dies, he gives long blessings. We're not going to go into all of that, but he gives long, long blessings. The, the, the Saturday morning group <laughs> will spend a lot of time on this, um, talking about each of the each of the boys and their tribes and their their good qualities and their bad qualities. Uh, but then there's also this very, very uh, touching story of uh, of Jacob with Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, who were born in Egypt. The question is whether or not they are Israelites, whether or not they're MOTs, whether or not they're they're included in in the clan, and. Uh, whether people were talking about that, whether the other, you know, the, you can imagine some of the other uh, tribes and some of the other children were were questioning and whatever and ever and ever. So, so Jacob uh, has a has a little ceremony that he envisions, and when Joseph, uh, on, uh, when Jacob's on his deathbed, we we have to assume it's not the first time that he has met. Manasseh and Ephraim, but he he performs a ritual that rabbinic tradition says is an adoption ceremony. And they have to do that because Joseph's wife wasn't Jewish. So Manasseh and Ephraim, if they're going to be part of the Israelite uh, community, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, they have to be adopted into the, into the into the uh, into the tribes. If you will, so uh, Jacob brings Manasseh, uh, Joseph brings Manasseh and Ephraim, places them on Joseph's knees, but Jacob crosses his hands so that his right hand, which is the symbol of more more importance in uh, in the tradition, his right hand goes on Ephraim's head, even though Manasseh was the older, and uh, no, the other way around. That he puts his right hand on uh, Manasseh, Manasseh's head, left hand on Ephraim, even though Ephraim was the older, and uh, the, the blessing that he that that and blesses them, and that becomes that becomes the blessing by which um, Jewish fathers 
all bless their sons. Um, may you may you be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, uh, Ephraim so they, was, they are. Ephraim was the younger. I, I did it, I did it backwards again. Yeah. It's Monday morning, just getting started. Okay, right. Ephraim is the youngest, but he but he gets the blessing. He he gets the oh, the right hand, okay. right. Um, um, and more importantly, that dominates. There's not a lot of commentary, but that dominates the commentary about that little gesture is not so much of what jacob did i mean he's the you know he's the head honcho of the tribes and the the clan he he can do whatever he wants to do joseph says no abba dad no you got it you got it wrong it's the other way and jacob says no this is the way it shall be um and the fact that ephraim and manasseh don't say anything they don't argue they don't say wait a minute you know, Manasseh says, wait a minute, I, I should be getting this and da, 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 like Jacob and Esau and, you know, and 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 others throughout um, throughout the earlier uh, days and stories of Genesis. So the fact that there's no argument between the two of them is what the rabbis pick up on as being the most important lesson of this little vin vignette is that ideally there should be no controversy and no arguing um between all all of the tribes ephraim and manasseh are given full status as uh, as as tribes and the fact that they are okay with uh with their with their blessing should stand as a uh, as a a sign for all of all of the tribes that's what the way most of the commentary goes on Can i jump um, in Sure, this, please. This is, this is like a healing for what happened between Jacob and Esau. Yeah. Where, you know, there was um, contention about who got the blessing. And it was done by trickery and deception mm -hmm. and lasting um, conflict. Whereas here, it's totally open. Exactly. You know, Jake, Jacob knows what he's doing. He's telling them. You know, this is where the blessing goes. It doesn't mean that Menachem isn't the firstborn. We're not taking that away. And there's whatever goes to the, but certain kinds of, I don't know, spiritual leadership qualities are recognized in Ephraim. And so this is sort of like, this is how the pattern is going to be in terms of spiritual leadership. Ideally. Ideally, Ideally. well, right. that mm -hmm. it doesn't, doesn't mean that the firstborn gets everything. He has some things, but not everything. Right. And sometimes another child will, will take the, the banner in, in other ways. But this is now out in the open, no deception. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right, right. Um, but having said that, and back to the comment that, that Steve, Steve had earlier, um, after Jacob dies and is buried back in the cave of Machpelah, okay, the rest of the brothers do start to, you know, there's there's concern that Joseph is going to punish them. Now the dad has is gone, okay. Joseph's finally going to come for retribution on us for what we what we did to them, okay. But he he reassures them that that's not the case we are we are all hunky dory we're all lovey lovey everyone is everyone is fine let's just uh, be one one big happy family joseph lives to 110 but apparently by that point already there's a sense that either the israelites are being told that they cannot leave egypt or the israelites have decided we don't want to leave egypt so Joseph makes them promise that when they do, and it's not it's not clear is whether when you are allowed to leave or when God will come to take you out of Egypt, referring back to the promise to Abraham that David was talking about, that ultimately they will be they they have been taken down to Egypt, but then after the number of years are not 
uh, are not itemized, but after a number of years and generations, God will bring them back out of Egypt, back to the promised land. So with, with whichever scenario it is, Joseph makes them promise that they will carry their bones out, up out, carry his bones up out of Egypt, back with them to the promised land. And that does indeed happen next week when we encounter the beginning of the, the story of, uh, of Exodus, well, more than next week. Um, but when we get to the story, when they do leave Egypt after the Passover, uh, that, that they, it, it specifically says, and they took Joseph's bones with them as they, as had been, as had been promised. Okay. Question? Um, yeah, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, just that, um, and this may have been mentioned before, I, I don't know, but there is a historical theory that the um, uh, dynasty that was friendly to the Hebrews is a totally different no ethnic question. group than the later enslaving pharaohs, uh, that these, uh, you know, earlier pharaohs, the one that uh, appointed Joseph as, you know, as a very high position in the government, they were Hyksos. And the Hyksos were Semitic. So they sort of had a little bit of an understanding, a little bit of a, a kinship, and the later pharaohs were not, you know, which just goes to show you how important family is sometimes <laughs> and, and family connections, you know, that right. this was right. a different, they, this what, was a what... different group of kings totally. And it said, you know, well, they didn't know Joseph, you know, or, well, they just didn't have any connection. They said, you know, you're, you're nothing to us, you know. <laughs> Those are the other pharaohs who were, you know, had, had a connection with you. Right. Again, I'm, uh, I'm going to defer to, to Lynn, who's the scholar in this area. Yeah, well, yeah. They were the ones who came later were Native Egyptians who kicked out the invaders, the Hyksos. Uh -huh. and reclaimed leadership and the rule of their own country. So they're looking at these peoples who are up there who um, were allied with those who had essentially invaded and taken over their country for a couple of centuries. Um, so no, they weren't friendly to them, to the, to the remaining, they were suspicious. It's like having a fifth column. And that also the Hyksos were, the invaders were Semitic, is that? Well, correct? they came, they came, we don't know exactly where they came from. They could, but they came from, you know, maybe Northern Syria or Anatolia or somewhere from Northeast coming in through. They were, they were, um, I mean, Egyptian is a Hamitic Semitic blend of language. So the Egyptians are also partly Semitic. So it's just, but basically they came from outside the country, maybe somewhere in Syria, maybe mm -hmm. somewhere in Mesopotamia or Northern, somewhere out there. Maybe even- I, I had also, I don't remember where I had heard it or, or read it, uh, and, and I'm giving an over oversimplification that there had been a power struggle between the, 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 the more ancient original Egyptians and the Hyksos and the Israelites allied, al aligned themselves with the Hyksos and the Hyksos were pushed back, but the, but the Israelites who were there were then enslaved as a result of fighting against. Uh, I don't remember where that one came from, but. I don't know that there's historical evidence of that. But the right. whole the whole thing about the enslavement is seen within the context of Egyptian culture. I mean, when the Nile flooded and the farmers couldn't work in their fields, they went to work on public projects and they were fed. Mm -hmm. You know, if they didn't store enough grain. So it was basically it's like community service. Everybody did it. You dug canals or you built stuff or you repaired stuff, but you were working during the time of the flood. And that um, then along came some of the later kings in uh, Pharaoh's and new kingdom and said, well, I wanna build a lot. So I'm gonna keep, keep the, the labor force 
from going back. And that was, it wasn't only, they, I mean, they might have subjected um, especially the foreign peoples, but the irregular Egyptians had to do the work too from, from for a thousand years before. Right. That was a pattern in Egyptian culture. So when they talk about slavery, there's all the, you know, initially it was community service. And then the, the pharaohs sort of um, transferred it into like, no, you don't just do your community service. You stay on and work for me. And it became true sir, slavery, probably, probably the Ramesides, the Ramesside kings. But all the earlier New Kingdom kings for centuries that the Jews lived there were not like that. That's why they grew and right. were successful. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I like to share with you some of the some of the insights that 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 I have gotten in the collection from my teacher back in Jerusalem, as Nachama Leibovich. And she focuses on a couple themes out of this last portion, the last story that we that we've been talking about, the end of the Joseph cycle, if you will. The first that she that she tries to address is with Jacob's final message to Joseph and the brothers. Uh, and he tries to uh, em emphasize to them that he still has an attachment to Canaan, to the promised land, to the uh, to the Aretz, to the, the, the land as promised, as an everlasting holding, uh, as a Yerusha. In other words, that, that he wants to remind them by saying, promise me that you'll bury me in, in Machpelah, parenthetically adding, and don't forget to come and visit my grave, right? You know, you need, you need to come back there also, um, that your time in Egypt is only temporary. And there will come a time, God promised it, there will come a time when you will be coming back to the promised land. Um, and then, then uh, he refers to Rachel and her burial site, as we were talking about earlier, um, and and the the rabbis question why why do you have to mention that uh, uh, and and the the usually they answer the 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 general answer is that uh, Joseph thought that uh, Jacob thought that Joseph might have resented the fact that uh, that Rachel is not buried with the other founding fathers and mothers of, of the people, that Leah is, uh, the handmaidens are not, but Leah and Rebecca and Sarah are buried there. Uh, but so Jacob wants to give, um, um, wants to give uh, Rachel the special honor, uh, especially of being Joseph's, Joseph's mother also. Um, um, uh, and, um, so he tries to explain in the in the midrash and the different commentaries. He, Jacob tries to explain to Joseph and the other brothers who are listening why Rachel has this special or different burial place. Um, and uh, some of the rabbis say that he says, "Well, he could he couldn't leave. I mean, they, this they were on a journey, and he couldn't leave." all the rest of his, the, the, the clan. He couldn't leave them, the children, the cattle and whatever, to divert from their important journey to go and, to go and three days journey to, to Hebron, to Machpelah, to the cave and bury, and bury her there. Um, one of the rabbis uh, says uh, in, 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 in supporting Jacob that he was overcome with, overcome with his grief and he couldn't bring himself to um, uh, to to leave everybody. He needed the support of of the whole community. Um, and so when he says this to Joseph, in in preparation for his uh, his being taken back to uh, to burial, um, he says, "And I and I've borne the the the, the grief, and I've borne the, the the guilt of not giving Rachel." Her full, do, her full and due honor. I've all all these years 
Um, so he, he, he kind of confesses that. Uh, that's Sephorno's uh, uh, commentary. Um, Ibn Ezra jumps in to, to defend Jacob that uh, Rachel's death was so sudden and there was no one to, uh, to care for the body. There was no embalming available. Uh, there was no support available uh, available to maintain the dignity of her physical presence to take her to Hebron. So it was much better to go ahead locally and and bury her there. Rashi jumps in and says he buried her there at God's command to fulfill the prophecy. And again, remember when Rashi's mind and many of the commentators we've quoted this often. There's no past, present, or future. So Rashi can go ahead and talk about a prophecy from uh, from the prophet Jeremiah, who is a thousand, thousand years later, or more than a thousand years later, uh, who said that uh, Rachel is weeping for, his, for her children as they fled on the Babylonian captivity right past, past her grave. So it, th that, that Jeremiah's words would not hold weight if Rachel wasn't buried there to be able to have that, that scene described. Um, but Rachel's tomb, uh, in, in, in mainstream Jewish tradition, Rachel's tomb is seen as a reminder of God's presence whether it's specifically within the borders or not within the borders, and a promise that they will return to the land to be able to pay 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 tribute, and they talk about reciting Kaddish at uh, and and reciting uh, Tehillim Psalms at at Rachel's at Rachel's tomb. Um, the other thing that Nahama uh, jumps in and talks about that I remember um, is the the brothers. Uh, who fear that after Jacob's death, the brothers fear retribution from from Joseph. Um, so they sent they they sent a message to Joseph saying that our father commanded that you forgive us. Now again, we have no no way of knowing. It's not described in the text. It's not discussed in the text. We we have no way of knowing whether Jacob actually was ever told the truth. He may have assumed, he may have inferred, but we, we have no way of knowing if they, if they ever confessed to him, if Joseph ever, ever complained to him about what the brothers had done. There's no reference specifically in the text. Did Joseph know? Did Jacob know? I'm sorry, did Jacob know? Did Jacob know what the brothers the brothers had done, um, and so the rabbis then, in 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 trying to figure out, they look for clues in some of Jacob's words, um, and in some of the brothers' words as well. But they they get into a in, into a a, a, a a dialogue and and debate on whether or not, uh, and we have these these debates today. Uh, whether or not it's it's all it's permissible to lie for what they called and, and they they make the lesson out of this for shalom bait for the sake of peace in the household or peace peace in the family and they start to cite other times in the Torah mo most of you are familiar with back at the time with with Abraham and 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 uh, and Sarah when Sarah is told that she's going to give birth. And she laughs and and she says, "Are you kidding? We, my husband's so old; he's going to be able to impregnate me." And but then, when the story is told to Abraham, um, it it it's said in a little different little different way, you know. So, uh, is it okay to lie for the sake of shalom bayit? Um, actually, the Talmud, in resolving this discussion, the Talmud even considers lying for the sake of shalom bayit to be a mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah that comes from the Torah other than examples or illustrations in the Torah, but they do call it, and it's in the, it's in the tractate Yibamot, if you want to look it up, they do say that lying, that shalom bayit is high enough on the hierarchy of the values, what they call the midot, the, the values and the attributes of Jewish Jewish 
uh, life or to get into another argument of, of ethical behavior, but believe it or not, they say that even that lying can even be a true ethical behavior for the, if it's for this for the proper sake of shalom bite. Um, and they they go into is truth an absolute value? Uh, because after all, God even there are times, especially in uh, in the uh, not in the Torah so much, but in the rest of the Bible, there are times when God says one thing but then actually does something else, uh, specifically in the, the book of Samuel, for example. Um, and then the conclusion, and I'll quote Nechama specifically, truth must give way to other values more important, sometimes in the interests of peace and sometimes for the sake of life itself. So that's a, that's a, a, a lesson, if you will, that comes out of out of this uh, this particular story, uh, and and with those words, we come to the conclusion of the book of Bereshit of Genesis. Traditionally, we say Chazak Chazak Benit Chazek. We'll let us be strong, be strong as we strengthen each other with the with the lessons that we have learned out of these stories. Yes, Steve. Yeah, um, and I I don't know if you've touched on this before, but you mentioned uh, classes with uh, Nechama. Leibovitz, and I don't know if everyone realizes what a VIP of Israeli letters oh, no this, this, right. this woman is, right. you know, and actually that's a familial dynasty because her older brother was Yeshayahu Leibovitz, who was very well known. I remember when I was, you know, living in Israel, like in the early 70s, he had a regular program on uh -huh. the radio, uh, you know, talking about Parshat the Shavua. And, exactly. You know, right. he, yeah. he was, well, he was uh, more he of was, the philosopher. He was more of the philosopher and she was more of the, the textual analysis person. But hmm. it, but in my day, every American or foreign student who was who was studying in Israel, uh, it was like it, it was. It wasn't a requirement that you had to study, take Nechama's classes, but but it was free. So if you could mm. work it into your schedule, for like for us where we were studying at the yeshiva as opposed to at Hebrew University, if we could work it into our schedule, we didn't have to pay tuition to attend her class. Oh, but I, I find it very cool that you were right. able to attend that class. And uh, Yeshayahu Leibovitz, though, he, had, he was very widely... Uh, he, he was a very uh, knowledgeable person. He yes. knew a lot about a lot of things, and he did come across a little arrogant sometimes, like, <laughs> uh, well, you know, because of his, he, he just had many Israelis. That's it, right. it, it, <laughs> he came across. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He just had extraordinary breadth of knowledge. So I just wanted to insert that uh, footnote if if you oh, haven't yeah. mentioned it uh, before, but uh, that that that's Probably a name that you should year, drop but, off and yeah <laughs> but right okay okay any any questions any concluding comments michael please yeah i had to step i had to step away a few times but in the issue of lying uh you probably discussed this but there are times that uh one um uh, out of good conscience has to lie mm -hmm. to uh, preserve life or protect the person and it's the same way with the issue of stealing. Uh, uh, that uh, that's a very big issue for me about stealing. Uh, about uh, stealing. Uh, uh, well, you know, you can steal someone's life. Uh, I can't gather my thoughts right now in my mind, but in, in any no, I, I, I appreciate I appreciate and agree with what with what you're saying, and that's what we were talking about here is that yes, lying for the sake, not lying for lying's sake, but or dishonesty, but lying for the sake of saving a life or preserving what they call shalom bite, preserving you know peace in the home, peace among the family. Yes, that's that's considered not only not only is it okay it sometimes you must do that required right right and and uh, there's the same thing they uh, i'm forgetting the second the, the the second word but but um uh, and, uh both in hebrew and in english but there's there's a difference between uh stealing for the sake of your own personal benefit and 
I guess robbing, just to make a distinction in the words, and, and robbing for the sake of saving someone else's life or providing for someone else's life. You know, the, the, uh, the, the classic example that comes in the literature, I, I don't remember exactly where it is, is someone who steals a loaf of bread so that their children don't go hungry. Well, there's another part to that. The other side of that is a, is if you if you commit murder, you 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 have stolen someone's life. Yes, that's, that's another part of what I was trying to get at. Right, and there are right. other uh, examples of that. But uh, I was. Or you can really... you can steal you can steal someone's dignity. You can steal someone's self esteem. And someone's freedom. And... You can, and someone's freedom by by right. slavery. Right. So there's many. Right. There, there are different points to that. Right. Uh, examples, that's, exact, right. that's exactly what, what Talmud, Mishnah and Talmud is all about, is, is to using all of these different specific cases and say, well, how do, how do we understand this? And what was the motivation here? And what was going on? And what did, what did the rabbis mean when they used this as a proof text? So what, what was the story there? It's fascinating. Anyone else? Again, I thank you very much for, for joining in the discussion. January 10th then, and, and we'll send something out, but it'll be a little different time. It'll be a little bit, a little later, like 11.15 or 11.30 on January 10th. 